Antichrist Identified, Part 3. Alright, the Antichrist. So far in these lectures, we have pretty well identified who and what the Antichrist is. So in this lecture, we are going to concentrate on his deception and why it happens. But what have we learned so far in these lectures? We have seen that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Ezekiel 28 that Satan will come and magnify himself and will sit in the temple of God and claim to be God. In other words, he will claim to be Jesus returned. In the book of Daniel, we have seen that Satan is desolation or the desolator who commits abomination by causing the worship of God, which is to say the true Christ, to cease because he deceives the world into worshiping him in place or instead of Christ. In the book of Mark, but actually in all the Gospels, you will find that Jesus said to beware the Antichrist and to wait for the one true husband, the true Messiah, and to let your flight not be in the winter. In other words, don't be harvested out of season at the incorrect time. And Jesus said that we would be delivered to councils and set before kings and rulers for a testimony against them. And that we were to take no thought beforehand, neither should we premeditate what we speak, but speak only that which is given us in that hour. For it is not we that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now we cannot accomplish this if we aren't here to do it. In other words, if we are raptured, as many believe. Jesus said, Lo, I have told you all things or foretold you all things. Jesus gave us insight into this false Christ reign and his deception of the entire world. It is written that the whole world shall wander after the beast save of God's elect. In the book of Revelation we have heard that a one world government will arise which this Antichrist will be the head of and that the world will be fooled into believing that this person, that Satan, is Jesus through the miracles and powers that he uses to deceive many. That this one world system will get close to coming to power right before the Antichrist begins reigning. So now we are going to cover some more books and verses which due to their mistranslation and a modern English only understanding of scripture have misled those who preach and teach doctrinally to err and to believe that there will be a rapture or in any moment unannounced return of Christ to take away his church. They teach this rather than how Jesus said he would actually return. So now let's go and look at some of this false teaching which will aid the Antichrist at his coming. Before we do this, let us pray. Father in heaven, we come before you and we ask, Father, that you give wisdom, that you open eyes and ears, that you give your blessing to our minds, that we may gain wisdom from the study of your word, and that we may understand these things, that we may understand this Antichrist that we may understand his method, and that we may not be deceived. And we ask this, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let's go and look at the most missed often understood verses and see where and how the actual message of Jesus Christ's return got lost in translation. So that we may better understand and hopefully avoid this deception of the Antichrist. With that, now let's turn over to the book of 1 Thessalonians. And this letter is one of the most very misunderstood chapters in the entire Bible. So misunderstood, even in Paul's time, that he hurriedly <coughs> wrote 2 Thessalonians in an attempt to straighten out the misunderstanding. So let's go and have a look at this misunderstood chapter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and we will begin at verse 13. And verse 13 reads, and this will be Paul speaking, 
But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. This is to say, those who have passed on, or those who have died. That ye sorrow not, even as those who have no hope. Which is to say, the unlearned, those who don't believe. Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so to them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, or God will bring with him. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Okay? Now this is this is Paul's understanding of the word of God. And he's giving it to you right here. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Why? Why can't we prevent them? Or why would we? Well, we can't, first of all, because they are already there with Jesus. Remember Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. Ere that silver cord shall part, and we re instantly return to the Father which gave us. And as it is written in uh, 2 Corinthians by this same author, Paul, in chapter 5 and verse 8, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Therefore, when we die, we are instantly back with the Father. Remember, Jesus told the malefactor on the cross next to him, Today you shall be with me in paradise. Verse 16, to continue. For the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Now this is very important that you understand this. The trump of God is the seventh trump, the last trump. It is not the sixth trump. It is the seventh. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Again, they rise first because they are already with him. The dead in Christ rise first because they are already with him. You have to remember, anytime you read the Bible, the Bible is written notoriously in the third person because of the speech and colloquialisms. Verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay, this is where it gets hard to understand. This is where you really have to do your homework in translation or you will be confused. Because if you take this in its English only reasoning or how this was translated you are going to be misled. First of all, let's review and break down this last verse and under, into understandable terms. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Okay. This means at Christ's return, we shall join those who are dead in Christ. In other words, they're not dead necessarily. They're just dead to the flesh. They've passed on out of the flesh. But they are alive and well in their spirit bodies. We shall join them. We shall be changed into spirit bodies. Which is to say, our flesh shall perish. But we shall be transformed into spirit bodies. The main reason for this is that flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. They cannot inherit it. And when Christ returns this time, he is coming as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And kingdom, in its definition, means the king and his dominion. When this happens, we shall join those who have already died, but who are alive in their spiritual bodies. Okay, on to the next analogy. The clouds, as in, in the clouds. Now I know, reading this in English, you hear the word cloud, which you already associate with heaven, as all do, or many do. And since we are taught to think this way from an early age, in fact, it's burned into our psyche, people associate this that we're going to fly up into the air. But what does this word cloud mean? To find out, we have to go to the creek. 
And when we do, we find out that this word cloud is the same word used also by Paul, the same author, in another of Paul's letter. The book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1. This same word for cl uh, cloud is utilized. It is a colloquial word meaning a large group or mass. If you read the book of Hebrews chapter 12, it says, Seeing we are encompassed in such a cloud of witnesses. Now, this was just colloquial Greek speech. But you can better understand this if you think of a cloud of bees. Or if you've ever seen a bunch of birds on a lake and a child ran down and scared them, they took off. And there was such a mass of them, it's a cloud. Or you can also relate this to a cloud of locusts. This is the use of this word, cloud. The Greek word which means cloud in the sky is stratos, which is where our word stratus or stratosphere comes from, stratus cloud. But this word cloud means a large gathering, even the hosts of heaven. We shall meet Jesus in a large cloud of souls or witnesses. A large group of us who have already passed, or a large group of them who have already passed on, joining with us who now meet them at Christ's return. Now let's move on to the next part. To meet him in the air. Here again is another word which is deceptive in English only. This word air is also a colloquial Greek word. And we associate air with clouds, sky, and so on. You get the picture. And it's no wonder that this chapter has been misunderstood for so long. Because in English, we associate clouds again with sky, air, the air. But this word air is the word A-R or A-E-R in Greek. This word air, by its definition in Greek, means breath as in respiratory. In other words, life, breath of life, as of a living being. So let's cover the thought as it actually should be read rather than as it has been taught in an English-only understanding. We which are alive and remain until the Lord's coming shall meet and join with those who have already passed on. We with them shall make up a large crowd we shall change into spiritual bodies as they already have. And we shall be in one group. One could even say the vast many-membered body of Christ. You can also think of this word air in the terms of the book of Genesis where God placed the breath of life into the body of Adam. In other words, the earth or the clay God placed in it became a living soul. God breathed the breath of life into his nostril and he became a living soul. Earth and clay are what all humans are made of. And when this happened, Adam was born. Not necessarily born as a child, but he was born. The soul of Adam was placed into the earth, into a man, into a, a clay jar, you might say. This is an, an analogy used later where um, the potter's field is concerned in the New Testament. Broken pottery, clay, can be put back together, in other words, by Christ. Now I will say again, I don't ask you to believe this just because I say it so, nor to take my word for it. I sure hope you will go and check this out for yourself that you will obtain a strong concordance of the Bible and look these words up and see if the way that you are taught matches up to the actual definition of the words used. Paul knew this in his time. He knew the difficulty of languages. And as you look these things up, you may very well be surprised about a great many things you've learned in the Bible. All right, to continue with this study, let's go to another example of how this any moment doctrine came into being due to misunderstanding of the Greek in the New Testament and how it will lead people to fall and worship the wrong Christ. 
Let's go to another pivotal verse, which uh, many who teach the rapture doctrine use to make their case for rapture. Let's see if that is correct or misunderstood. Let's go now to the book of Matthew in the New Testament to chapter 24 and we will begin with verse 36 and verse 36 reads and this will be Jesus speaking but of that day and that hour no man knoweth no not the angels of heaven but my father only this means no one can predict it we can know the season we will know it is the fig tree generation as prophesied but we won't know the absolute day verse 37 but as in the days of Noe or better translated Noah were so shall the coming of the Son of Man be verse 38 for as in the days before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered into the ark. Verse 39. And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall it be, or so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now many people take this to say, well that, that right there means that nobody's going to know it until Jesus has already been here and taken them. Yeah, that's what it would sound like in the English unless you had read the rest of the Bible and you know all the warnings given against such a thing, such a teaching. Now this next verse is a very tricky one. This is what a lot of people base the rapture on. Verse 40. Two shall be in the field. The one shall be taken and the other left. Now most people say, well I sure don't want to be the one left behind. They've even made a movie about that called Left Behind. So they take this to mean that the one is, that is taken is taken by Jesus. In other words, raptured, flown out of here. But this word taken in Old English, in which it was translated to, means the same thing as if you use it in a sentence like, there was a great battle and the castle was taken. In other words, that is to say, captured or taken by the enemy. The one left behind here actually is the one who is not deceived. Remember, it is written, Blessed is he who when the Lord returns he shall find working. In other words, blessed is the one that is not deceived by the Antichrist. Okay, let's go a couple more places here in this lecture to try to understand these misinterpretations and verses that lead to this mistaken doctrine of a rapture. Let's go once again to the writings of Paul to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 50. And this will be Paul speaking. Verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven, of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. Okay, this means we're not all going to die. But we're going to be changed. And this covers exactly what I've been talking about here. The change of the bodies. Leaving the flesh. Verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. When? At the last trump. The farthest trump out, the seventh trump, not the sixth trump. To continue. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. changed from your flesh body into your spiritual body to meet the Lord in the air. This is what this means and this is why Paul clarifies it in all of his letters. Verse 53 For this corruptible 
must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This is to say, this mortal, which means liable to die, must put on deathlessness. Now let's go one more place. We're going to go back to the Old Testament here. We know in the Bible that God has foreseen many things, that he has prophesied many things, and that he is led by type and example, and by the written word. And we're going to go back now to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 13. And we're going to see what God thinks about this rapture, about this flyaway, and about those who teach it. We're going to see what God thinks about the idea of escaping the tribulation by running away. By the so-called flyaway. Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Okay. This is God saying that go tell them who prophesy out of their own hearts to hear the word of the Lord. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. Verse 40. Israel, thy prophets are like foxes in the desert. Okay. This is an analogy, a Hebrew analogy. Foxes in the desert. The desert's arid and dry. There's not much food. This means they're ravenous. They're hungry. They'll leap on anything. Verse 5. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. A gap is an opening. It means you haven't filled the opening. A hedge was to surround the house. This means to protect it. What this is saying is, you have not filled the gaps, nor built up the hedge for the house of Israel so that they can stand in the day of the of battle in the day of the Lord. Verse 6. They have seen vanity and lying divination saying the Lord saith and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Verse 7. Have ye not seen a vain vision? And have ye not spoken a lying divina divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Verse 8 Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity, and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord. Verse 9 and my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people, neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord God. Verse 10. Because, even because, they have seduced my people, saying, Peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, and lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Untempered mortar here is religion, false religion. False religion does not strengthen. It does not build your wall. Rather, it makes it weak. Verse 11. 
Say unto them which daub with untempered mortar, that it shall fall, and there shall be an overflowing shower. And ye, O great hailstone, shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Verse 12. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it, me not, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the daubing wherewith ye have daubed it? In other words, where is your religion now? Your false lying divinations. You're prophesying out of your own heart. You know, prophesying out of your own heart means it didn't come from God. It wasn't written in His Word. Verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind in my fury, and there shall be an overflowing shower in mine anger, and great hailstones in my fury to consume it. Verse 14. So I will break down the wall you have daubed with untippered mortar, and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered. Or that the foundation shall be discovered thereof. This, in other words, is to say, God will reveal the truth so that it is discovered and destroy the deception so that it is discovered. And this deception happened, or will happen, because those who teach and preach nowadays haven't really studied. Many of them. Some have. But many teach by tradition, or by doctrine. Many spend their time throwing fake healing shows, or holding telethons for money, or various other pursuits. Getting up and talking about things that man should have the sense enough to know in the first place. Be good to thy neighbor. Love thy wife and family. Don't steal. Well, we know these things already. These are common sense. Well, <laughs> I should say they're common sense, but in today's world they are a commodity, actually. A precious commodity. But people do listen to this false doctrine and it is the untempered mortar. It will cause their wall... Uh, now, let's think of this. A wall is for your protection. And if your wall is not made with something strong, it will fall. Well, your wall is your religion. Your beliefs. To continue with verse 14. And it shall fall and shall be consumed in the midst thereof. And ye shall know that I am the Lord, as opposed to anyone else who claims to be the Lord, that is to say, any other being. Verse 15. Thus I will accomplish my wrath upon the wall, and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar, and will say unto you, The wall is no more, neither are they that daubed it. Verse 16. To wit, the prophets of Israel, which prophesy, which this word prophesy means teach, concerning Jerusalem, and which see visions of peace for her, and there is no peace, saith the Lord. <clears throat> and you hear this all the time now, it's on the news. Peace for Israel, peace for the Middle East, peace, peace, peace. It's really been a big saying since the 60s. Peace and love. But there is no peace. There is no peace without knowing the truth, that is. Verse 17. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people which prophesy out of their own hearts. This again is the same thing as the wicked ones who prophesy out of their own hearts, written up above. Only this is addressed to the daughters. In other words, again, they prophesy out of their own minds, out of their own doctrines, out of their own traditions, instead of God's word and proper translation. And prophesy thou against them. And say, verse 18, and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sow pillows to all armholes, 
and make kerchiefs upon every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Now we're going to stop and break this verse down here. First of all, the women that sew pillows to all armholes. A pillow in this time is not the little two-foot pillows that we have on our beds these days. No. A pillow was a big long thing in this time. Even like a small mattress, you might say. And if you sew these small mattresses to the armholes of a man's shirt, it would cover his arms. Now this may be difficult to comprehend for some, but it is a Hebrew analogy, a Hebraism, which means they cover God's outstretched arms. This is just a saying. It means to pollute is actually what it means. You cover my outstretched arms. And this is why it says, Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come unto you? He knows they can't. Verse 19. And it's going to be made clear right here. And will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? In other words, will you teach falsehood and incorrect teachings for gain, for money, for mammon, you might say? How many churches get on TV and hold telethons and say, if you don't send us a million dollars, the Lord's going to come and he's going to fling down great hailstones on us. Or worse, he's going to come and he's going to take only a few instead of many. Anyway, to continue with verse 19, or I'm going to reread part of it. Will you pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive which should not live by your lying to my people which hear your lies or in other words which will listen to your lies and not study for themselves? Look at the people in church right now. Look at the things that are being taught. So many things now are being taught in church which are ungodly. Want me to list a couple? Gay marriage. Doing away with the death penalty. These are things God has called for. And yet you've got people which will protest for them. Anytime a murderer is put to death now, you'll have a bunch of Christians out there holding, waving the Bible and holding candlelight vigils for this one who has done murder and had no pity on the one he killed or the many that he killed. And even though God's word says, give him over into the hands of the shedder of blood so that he can be sent to me for judgment, you still have Christians out there standing right with the leagues of Satan. In other words, they're teaching falsehoods. They're teaching misleading doctrines to anyone who will listen. And many of those who listen go to these people expecting to be taught the truth. Verse 20. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye hunt the souls of them, wherewith ye hunt the souls to make them fly. Gee, how about that? Wherewith ye hunt the souls to make them fly. Well, we're going to fly away, brother. We're going to rapture out of here. To continue. And I will tear them from your arms. And I will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. In other words, God will set his children free. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. Well, only through the Son's word, through Jesus' mouth, and through the word of God, can you be set free and debunk the lies 
and the false doctrines that are taught today. Many teach them in ignorance. It's, you know, I grant you that. But even so, they call themselves by the name pastor, priest, teacher, scholar, professor. Verse 21. Your kerchiefs also will I tear, and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Verse 22. Because with lies... You have the heart of the you have made the heart of the righteous sad. In other words, with your ignorance and your lies, you have caused them to be saddened. To continue, who I have not made sad, and strengthened the wicked, or strengthened the hand of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked ways. Again, false teachings teaching that ungodly things are okay and normal. See, that's the problem here. If you teach that these things are okay and normal, then you're not telling the wicked to return from his wicked way. Oh, but if I do that, they'll call me a bigot or a racist or whatever. They'll label me. They'll say I'm full of hate. Well, who cares what they say? They know nothing of God's word. God expects more of that than that from his children. The Christians of old were burned at the stake, thrown into the lion's den, and they didn't renounce their Christianity nor back down. And you're hard pressed now to find Christians that will stand for very much at all. Verse 23. Therefore ye shall see no more vanity nor divine divinations. In other words, your days of teaching lies and falsehoods are over. For I will deliver my people out of your hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yeah, they're going to know. They're going to know that only God is God, that only Jesus is Jesus, and that Satan is not the Lord, though he will claim to be. This is why it is written there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, and people will be praying for the mountains to fall on them. Just imagine that. If the true Christ returned and you had been found on your knees worshiping another. You now we could get into a whole bunch of analogies here about the husbandman and about the wife not waiting for her true husband as written in the Gospels. The wombs that never bore and the paps that never gave suck. Remember who the enemy is here. This is Satan we're talking about. Satan who tempted Christ in the desert, or attempted to tempt Christ in the desert. So if you think it's going to be easy standing up to his deception, if you think it's going to be a cakewalk, you're misleading yourself. It is written that for this cause, God has shortened the time he shortened the time because this deception is going to be very strong. And no one would have been saved, not even the elect. You see, Satan knows scripture. He knows the word of God. And he can quote scripture and mimic Jesus well enough to fool human beings in the flesh especially human beings who are only slightly versed in God's word and have not read the verses. None of us has ever seen Satan. None of us has ever seen Christ with our own eyes. And since we know from Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14 that Satan is a beautiful archangel and not some ugly creature, then he can deceive all the more. Because again, none of us have seen Christ or Satan with our own eyes. And if Satan, a beautiful archangel, with all these powers, as God's word as God's word decrees, comes here and claims to be Christ, how many people are going to stop to question it? How many people are just going to be sucked right into it and say, Oh, it's Christ, he's returned.
again, I don't expect you to believe me, nor do I ask you to, nor should you believe anyone on matters concerning God's word by hearing alone. Rather, you should go and look for yourself and dig into the old languages just to be sure that you're right. After all, who learns more? Those who listen, then study, then check things out for themselves? Or those who just go to church for an hour or two on Sunday and eat up whatever they're spoon fed? Again, the choice is yours. But don't let fear of your church or doctrine scare you into not looking. Don't let fear of questioning scare you. Because the whole idea is to be right and not wrong. May our Father give you the desire to be right and not wrong. May He give you the des desire to study His Word and to seek His counsel. Our Father is very good to us and He counts it when we try. Even if we aren't exactly correct, He counts it when we try. Again, the sixth trump, the sixth seal, and the sixth plague is when Lucifer, Satan, is cast here to play the role of the instead of Christ, in place of Christ, the Antichrist. And that the seventh trump returns the true Christ. And I know it's hard in this time with all the many different denominations in Christianity to trust but you simply have to do some studying on your own you have to be able to go in and look these things up because the body of Christ first of all is supposed to be one not divided the word denomination means split to be apart from it's supposed to be one body one body of Christ. Again, it is my prayer for you that you will seek God's counsel, that you will ask His wisdom, and that you will study to show thyself approved. Remember Amos chapter 8, the famine for the end times is for hearing the word of God. And 86% of this nation that we live in is Christian. And it is written in the book of Revelation that the whole world wandered after the beast save of God's elect. Well remember, the elect are few and the misled are many. Many are called, few are chosen. Please take these things into consideration and study on your own or find a gifted church or a gifted teacher to teach you. I wish you good luck in your study. Thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.